24, Courts Watch operated by our court clerk, Sue Hall, our official court reporter, Rachel Chickalese is present. She is the official record. The court's more recording is not available for release. This is the matter of State of New Jersey versus Christopher Greger, case 21-1881. The counsel is put their appearance on the record. Your Honor, Christine Lento for the State. Assistant Prosecutor Jamie Schroen for the State. Good morning, Ms. Lento. Good morning, Ms. Schroen. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Ms. Ferrante. Mario Gallucci on behalf of Mr. Greger, who is seated to my left. Thank you. Andrea Ferrante. Good morning, Your Honor. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Mr. Greger appears in court appropriately attired in a suit and tie. Counsel asked to conference in chambers this morning, so I apologize for the late start. We continue to experience a variety of challenging witness issues in terms of scheduling, which is unfortunate, but the only way to address it is to deal with them the best we can. So at this point, I know we wanted to have some discussion about some further witnesses, but Mr. Gallucci, do you want to proceed with your one witness today? Yes, Your Honor. I'm going to proceed with Mr. Greger. All right. Any objection to that process? No, Your Honor. All right. So we can go get the jury, and then we'll bring them over in a few minutes to get settled. Judge, did you want to – I don't know if counsel wanted to put some things on the record. Do you want to put things on the record now or after? It's up to you. About the other witness? Yeah. I thought we'd wait until after this witness. Oh, very well. The jury's already been here almost an hour, so I'd rather get the jury over here. That's fine. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Thank you.
huge watch for that one. advising that there was a revised schedule that the one defense witness that's necessary that's unavailable is going to be available on Friday the 24th, not Thursday the 23rd. So we had not given them that date before. I likely told them they wouldn't be coming in that day, so I think we should tell them as early as possible that that's a change of plan. Any objection to me saying that? No, no. I think that's best. No objection. See on the north side of the parking garage, the area has been fenced off for, I guess, a staging area for construction equipment. And then the construction is going to start immediately on the north side of this building, which is uh, previously been a parking lot. So I understand one or more of you may have been parking there, and that's going to close effective tomorrow. So that means you, the only, where, only place to park is across the street uh, in the parking garage. Uh, if you have a handicap sticker, I think you can park in meter space, and that usually prevents Tom's River Township from issuing any meter summons to see if you have handicap flags. Is that right, Sergeant? I don't know. She's tough. Yeah, she, I know she's <laughs> tough. You have to look at that. I believe that's, I believe that's the case. Uh, so I apologize for that. I'm hoping that this trial's over before we run into a lot of construction noise. It's my problem for future cases, but hopefully we'll be our problem together in this current case. But they're at least going to start doing some work, prep work, at that lot uh, this week, I believe. Uh, next issue is scheduling. We do have some some things for you today, but it probably won't be the whole day. Uh, the plan is for some witnesses tomorrow, again, not Friday. And then next week we're still having uh, some challenging scheduling issues. So right now I'd say be prepared for Tuesday the 21st, which I previously told you, um, definitely Wednesday the 22nd. But now one of the witnesses that was scheduled on the 23rd is uh, testifying in another state, so he's not going to be available until Friday the 24th. So I originally told you not Friday the 24th, so it looks like definitely the Friday the 24th will have to be here, but likely not Thursday the 23rd. So I apologize for that. If that presents an issue for anybody, let us know, um, and we'll, we'll have to address it. But if you can't be available on Friday, 
that's the, that's the Friday before the long weekend, before Memorial Day weekend, and then that Monday, of course, is the Memorial Day holiday. So if you need to think about that for a little bit or whatever, let us know before the end of the day if there's anything to discuss about scheduling, but that will be the plan going forward. Uh, anything else from council before we go for first next witness? No, Your Honor. No, Judge, right. thank you. All right, so uh, Mr. Gallucci, remember the state has not rested, but Mr. Gallucci is calling some witnesses out of order, so that's going to happen today. Mr. Gallucci. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, we call David Greger. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to provide is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, state your name and sign your last name, please. David Greger, G R E G O R. Thank you, Mr. Gulich. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Greger. Good morning. Mr. Greger, how old are you? 64. Are you currently employed? I'm self employed, yes. Okay. And what did you do before you were self employed? Uh, my career, uh, I spent 27 years as a state trooper. Okay, and was that in New Jersey? It was. Okay, and what roles did you have when you were a state trooper? Uh, various roles. I started off in a, uh, as a road trooper, went to a tactical unit for a dozen, half dozen years, emergency management, and then later in my career, homeland security. Okay, and did you, when you were a state trooper, did you teach at all? I did. Okay, what did you teach? Many disciplines. I taught, um, uh, initially, uh, in special operations, I taught scuba diving. I was a firearms instructor, self-defense instructor. Later in my career, uh, emergency management, crisis management, consequence management, a whole host of disciplines. Okay. Now, you said that currently you're self-employed. What are you self-employed now? I do. Uh, I do various consulting with regards to homeland security strategic planning, continuity of operations planning, emergency management exercises, traffic management. Okay. Are you married? I am. And what's your wife's name? Carolyn. Okay. And do you have any children? I do. And what are their names? Uh, David, Kimberly, Christopher, and Daniel. Okay. And do you have any grandchildren? I have one. Okay. Um, when your children were young, were you involved in any of their activities? I was involved with all their activities. Um, sports, um, certainly the school. Um, brownies for my daughter, ballet, uh, just about every I, everything my schedule would allow I was involved with. Okay. Um, and were you aware of the, your son's, your children's activities as far as high school and college and where they were? Uh, very much so. Okay. Um, did, were you aware of Christopher's college education? Yes. Okay. Did there come a time when Christopher moved to Baltimore? He did. Okay, what was that? 2017. And do you know why he moved? I do. And why was that? Uh, Christopher was um, entering uh, Johns Hopkins program, which was called the Urban Teachers, uh, for teaching in the inner city. And at the time he was going to school, he was earning his master's while he was under a mentorship uh, with other teachers in Baltimore. Okay. Now, prior to Christopher moving to Baltimore, did you know? a person named Rebecca or Brianna Mitchell? No. Okay. When was the first time you knew of their existence? I received a phone call the end of 2017, beginning of 2018, from a lady that identified herself as Rebecca. Now, where were you living at the time you received that phone call from this person? Monroe, okay. New Jersey. Um, without telling us what Rebecca said to you, what this person had said was Rebecca, Without telling us what she told you, what, if anything, did you do as a result of that? As a result of that phone call, I called Chris. Okay. And after you called Chris, did you receive another phone call from this person? Yes, I did. And when was that? A few weeks later. Okay. And after you received that, without telling us what that person told you, what, if anything, did you, as a family, make a decision to do? Uh, it wasn't until after the second phone call. Um, that a third phone call came from Rebecca to discuss um, how we were going to get involved. Okay. Is that when you became aware that you actually had a grandchild? It, it was. Okay. Uh, and did you learn the name of that grandchild? 
I did. Okay, and what was the child's name? His name was Corey. Okay, and was that your first grandchild? It was. Okay. And do you know how old Corey was when you first became aware of him? Yes, he was f about four years old. Okay. Now, when you received that phone call, did you come up with a plan? We did. What was that plan? Well, um, Corey began uh, visits with us, and so our plan was to make him as comfortable as possible when he came to the house, which involved, um, it, involved it was almost as if you were bringing home a newborn. It was finding out his favorite foods. It was what size clothes he wore. It was getting out uh, all the old sports equipment that I had put away years ago for my kids. It was creating an atmosphere for him uh, to make him comfortable. Uh, we redid the uh, bedroom next to ours, which had been uh, my wife's office. It was originally a bedroom. And then as our children moved out, it became an office. It was a bedroom again. So we bought a, uh, a toddler bed uh, and bought a mattress and put a school desk in the bedroom. Um, it was all encompassing. Do you recall the first day when you met Corey? I do. Or what day was that? August 8th. Okay. Now, at that time, did your family have visitation with him? Not yet. That visit was set up, um, and Christopher went to pick him up and brought him to our house for a couple hours. Okay. Um, did visitation ever change where it became more than just that couple of hours? On August 28th is when he had come to the house for uh, an extended visit. Um, and it was a Saturday and a Sunday, if I'm remembering correctly. And then subsequent to that in October is when uh, Christopher got a uh, shared custody agreement. Okay. Now, you said a shared custody agreement, and when was that? October, I forget. It was in the very beginning. Okay. Now, and that was in 2019? 19. Okay. So in October of 2019, um, did... If you know, did Christopher become the residential parent? He did. Okay. And when he became the residential parent, where was Christopher living? With us. Okay. And from October of 2019 until at some point Christopher moved? He did. And when was that? August 28th of 2020, he moved to Barnegat. So from October of 2019 to August 20th of 2020, where did Corey live? Uh, in the beginning of October through January, it was he was back and forth between locations. January 28th is when he was actually full time with us in terms of being uh, the residential parent, if you will. Okay. Now, from the day. Who lived with Corey when he lived in your home? Well, my wife, myself, and Christopher, then my daughter, Kimberly, and my other son, Daniel. Briefly explain the daily life of what happened when Corey was home with you living. So uh, he came to us full time at the end of January, and school was in session. So at the time, Christopher was teaching in uh, Camden. And it involved uh, early departure and a late arrival at home. So, in essence, for the first few months, um, I say I felt as if I was the dad. And so the uh, day would begin when he got up, and we would help him uh, get ready for school, take a shower. My wife would make him breakfast. My wife was working at the time. Uh, being self-employed, I had somewhat flexible hours. I tried to make it around Corey's schedule. And so... It was, it was all-encompassing. It's going through his book bag, making sure his assignments were in there, whatever permission slips or money he might have needed for that day. Um, it was seeing him off to school, waiting for him to come off the bus at 3 o'clock. They dropped him off right in front of the house, and generally I was there waiting with some kind of sports item or... Uh, 
and he would come back and we would uh, be engaged in some kind of activity uh, so he could unwind. And then I'd bring him in and the first thing is we went through his book bag and I say, wait, it was me because generally it was in the four o'clock or so area. My wife was just getting home and we had an agreement with the school at the time um, as part of the program he was in was to give us an analysis of how he did in school that day. And so every day there was teacher's notes in a little blue book he used to keep, and it was the first thing I went through when I went through his book bag, to see if he had a good day or did he have a bad day. And then subsequent to that, it was homework, dinner, hopefully Chris was home by that time so he could eat with him. If he wasn't, we did that, we got the homework ready, and it was always something that Chris wanted to spend the end of the day with him doing his homework. Now, where did Corey go to school when he moved in with you? At first, he was in Jamesburg School. Okay. And did that change? It did. And where did it change to? Uh, right in the beginning of October when uh, the um, residential custody was assumed, uh, we had meetings, Chris and I had meetings in Monroe to move him to the Barclay Brook School. Okay. And that's located in Monroe? It is. Okay. Now, there can, comes a time when Christopher and Corey move out of your Monroe home, right? Yes. Okay, and when was that? August 28th, 2020. And where did they move to? Barney. Okay. So, in 2020, Christopher moves out of Barney, and who lived with Christopher? Christopher and Corey. Okay, so they lived together. They did. Between the time that Christopher moved to Barnegat and March 20th, did you see Christopher and Corey? March 20th, 2021. I'm sorry, I, I was focused on something else. Okay. When, when Christopher and Corey moved out. Right. On that day. From August. From August. To, to March. March 20th of 2021. Did you ever see oh. Chris Yes, many times. How long? As often as we could get down. Um, we would take, uh, I used to crab a lot in that area, so I would go down during the week if my schedule permitted and the priority wasn't crab and it was getting over to the house and usually dropping off some kind of care package and spending some time with him if he wasn't in school at the time. And on the weekends, my wife would encourage me to go. Uh, I, I don't know how many times, many times. We've seen a video of a treadmill incident on, that occurred on March 20th of 2021. Have you seen that video? No. Why not? Because I don't want to see Corey mistreated. Okay. Um, between March 20th and April 2nd, did you see Corey? I did. And when was that? March 22nd. Okay. And why did you see Corey on March 22nd? Uh, on the 22nd, uh, Chris and Corey, uh, they were looking for a home to purchase. And so, being that we were involved with the purchase in terms of helping, we went down, my wife was a real estate agent, and showed them two houses in Bayville was one, the other one was near Barnegat. Okay, and how many houses did you look at two houses? Two houses. Okay. And did you see Corey that day? We did. Okay. And what was Corey's demeanor on March 22nd? Uh, he was happy and energetic. We were, the entire time we look at the both homes, we were talking about where his room would be and where would it be his yard to play with the dog. Um, he was excited. He ran around a lot. Um, I remember that because there was a situation at the one house on a trafficked street where as we were walking in the house, he ran out of the car and was running through the front yard and my wife got all excited and ran after to get him because uh, she was concerned with the street. But he had a lot of energy. He was very excited. Okay. Now, after you looked at the houses, what, if anything, did you do next? Uh, we visited my brother-in-law uh, down in Barnegat. Okay. And was Corey there? He was. And how was his demeanor at your brother-in-law's house? Uh, same. I'm happy, energetic. Uh, we were talking to him. I'm sure the, the visit was boring, but we kept saying, hey, we're going to go out and eat, and you're going to get French fries and everything to, to further his attention because it was all the adults visiting with each other. By the way, what was Christopher's demeanor on the 22nd when you were looking at the houses? Um, 
concerned. It was a major step in his life to purchase a home. Um, concerned that he could afford it. The homes we were looking at, of course, were all fixer-uppers. You know, we were helping. He's just starting off in his line of work. So funds were limited. And Objection, Judge. So what was his demeanor? was the question I asked. He was concentrating on the home, so he was very concerned. So when you got to your brother-in-law's house, what was Christopher's demeanor? Uh, relatively happy, you know, asking questions about how, how could we do things with the homes. Um, I'm talking about a whole host of things, but, you know, it, it seemed relatively normal to me other than the excitement about what the homes brought. Okay. Objection, Judge. It's speculation as, as to his subjective opinion as to normal. No. The answer is so it's fine. Thank you, Judge. After you visited with your family, did you finally take Corey out to dinner? We did. Okay. And where did you go to dinner? We went to the Sun Harbor Grill in uh, Barnegat. And what was Corey's demeanor at the Sun Harbor Grill? Um, he's excited. Uh, excited about the food. Um, and we talked about a whole host of things, but he was, he was happy. Now, between March 22nd and April 2nd, did you see Corey? No. On April 2nd, did you hear from Christopher? I did. And about what time did you hear from Christopher? It was sometime after 5. And where were you at the time? In the car. Okay, and where were you going? Um, my wife had called me. I went home to pick her up, and uh, we were heading down to Barnegat. Okay. And can you please describe the conversation you had with Christopher, that first conversation? The first conversation is when I took the phone from my wife. Um, Christopher was on the phone with her. I could hear it was loud uh, and very excitable, and I asked her to give me the phone, and then I got the phone. What was Christopher's demeanor during that conversation? Hysterical. Um, when's the next time you heard from Christopher? A few months later. Okay. And describe that conversation. It was the same. It was, he was inconsolable. He just lost his son. Um, when's the next time you heard from Christopher after that? Did you call him or he called you? I think there was a call right before 5.30, a relatively short call. I, I, I forget if he generated or I did. And after that, when's the next time you heard from your son? The next day, sometime after noon. I think it was after 1, actually. Okay, so that would be April 3rd? It would be. Okay. And what, if anything, did you discuss with your son? I discussed, one, where, where was he, um, and then I discussed, you, 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 you got to back, be back here. Um, we were distraught, um, told him to come home. Okay. And did there come a time that you rented a car? I did. Okay, and why did you rent the car, if you know? I do. Um, he was uh, stopped in Tennessee, uh, and his, uh, he had to give up his vehicle. Uh, and his cell phone, and he was without transportation. Okay. So did you arrange for transportation for your son to come home to New Jersey? We made several calls and located a uh, rental car um, place, and uh, we had made a call. I don't know who paid for it, but we were involved in trying to secure a vehicle for him. Okay. Um, and he eventually returned to New Jersey? He did. And what day was that? April 5th. Okay. So three days later. Yes. And when he arrived home in New Jersey on April 5th, where did he live? With us. After April 5th of 2021 until, did they, until July, uh, where did Christopher live? With us. And in July, did there come a time when police came to your house? Yes. And do you recall what day that was? July 8th. Okay. And which police came to your house? Barnegat, 
someone from the prosecutor's office and from my town, Monroe. Uh, what, if anything, did they ask? They were Objection, looking... it's hearsay, Judge. What, if anything, did they do? Well, they were looking for Christopher. They had asked me where he was. Okay. Was he home? He wasn't. Okay. Do you know where he was? I do. Where was he? He was on a hiking retreat out in western Pennsylvania. Okay. And how did he get there? My wife dropped him off. Now, did you talk to him on April, on July 8th? I did. Okay. And what did you tell him? I, exactly what I just said. The police were there and they were looking for him. Uh, they shared with me that there was a charge against them, but wouldn't share what the charge was. Okay. And did you make arrangements for him to come home? We did. And what were those arrangements that you made for him? Well, I, the, the original plan was to pick him up, uh, my wife and I, to go out to dinner, and at the end of the hike is to pick him up and bring him home. So there was no vehicle. So this was a Thursday, if I remember right, because it was near the weekend, and at that point, we were, it was getting near the end of the day, and we were like, how are we going to get a rent-a-car at the end of the day? And then at that point, I believe I called you to ascertain what exactly is the expectation in terms of his arrival back. He only can get home so quickly. And so it was nearing 5 o'clock, and it, it necessitated, based on the conversation with yourself, it necessitated him getting back as soon as possible. So I got involved to have to make a call out to the rental company to see if they would stay open a little bit longer because he was going to be on his way. Okay. What day did he come back? July 9th. The next day? The next day, he was 9 o'clock a.m. He was at Barnegat Police Station. Drove through the night. Okay. And do you know if he was arrested on that day? He was. And do you know what the charge was on that day? I do. And what was that? Endangering. Okay. Now... Between July 8th of 2021 and March of 2022, did Christopher live at your home at any point? Yes. And during that time he lived at your home, did he work? He did. Okay. Did he also have a girlfriend? He did. And what was his girlfriend's name, if you know? Laura. Okay. And between... July of 2021 and March of 2022, would he live between you and his girlfriend's house? Yes. Now, did there come a time in March of 2022 that you understood that Christopher was arrested again? Yes. Okay. And how did you find that out? Actually, my daughter told me. Okay. Your daughter, Kim? Kimberly. Okay. And do you know what he was arrested for at that point? I do. Okay, and what was he arrested for at that point? Murder. And this was almost a year since Corey had passed? Yes. When... Between July... Let me go here. After Corey passed, did you have any type of memorial to him? We did. And when was that? I believe it was April 8th. And can you tell us about that? Well, um, we had a separate wake subsequent to uh, the wake with his um, mother's family and a separate uh, ceremony at the uh, cemetery. Okay. Was Christopher present for the memorial? Objection, Judge. I think we're really, I don't understand the relevancy. Uh, it's overruled. You can say he's present for that. Was he present? Yes.
questions, Judge. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Becker. Good morning. Now, you testified before that your son, while he was in Baltimore, was in a program at John Hopkins, correct? Correct. And your son had previously graduated college from an online school, correct? For his bachelor's, yes. And he had been to several different undergraduate schools, correct? He did. And he ultimately finished his education with an online program, correct? I believe he received his associates from the county college and then the bachelor's from Ashford. So, you testified about a time period where you were caring for Corey, correct? Yes. And during that time period, you would be the person who would go through Corey's book bag, correct? I'd be one of the people that went through his book bag. And you would be the person who would get him off of the bus, correct? Generally. And you would be the person who would be checking his score, correct? One of the people. Okay. And you testified at a previous hearing, correct? I did. And in that previous hearing, although you're testifying now that you're responsible for all of these things, you couldn't recall what school grade Corey was in, correct? At that time, that's correct. And if you were the person doing all of these things, then your son wasn't doing those things in terms of being so involved in Corey's education, correct? No. It's not correct. So, your son was more involved in Corey's education than you were? I really didn't assign a percentage of who was more responsible. I took it as when I dealt with his schoolwork that I was 100% responsible in understanding where he was in his classes, what his assignments were, what he was struggling with, and what he was doing well with. That information was passed to my son as soon as he got home and in very many discussions so that he could pick it up and go through the same work that I did and understand all the things I just mentioned. Okay, but you were actually the person physically going through his book bag then, correct? I was one of the people. Right, and you're also the person you testified before who got him off the school bus, correct? Generally, I did, yes. Okay. So, based upon what you said then, you would agree that you were pretty integral in terms of caring for Corey while he lived in your house, correct? Absolutely. And then during August, right, the defendant and his son moved away from your home, correct? That's true. And at that point in time, they actually moved to Barnegat, right? They did. And they moved to the Atlantic Heights complex in Barnegat, correct? They did. And when your son moved with your grandson, at that point in time, you would have been less involved in Corey's care and education, correct? Yes. And that would be because you weren't with him every day, correct? That's correct. And at that point in time, it would have been your son's responsibility on his own to care for Corey, correct? Correct. Because you weren't there every day anymore, correct? No. And he would be solely responsible for going into his backpack, correct? Correct. And he would be solely responsible for making sure that he got picked up from school, correct? Correct. And he no longer had your guidance and your assistance at that point because he was no longer living with you, correct? Are you referring to Corey? I'm referring to your son. I would give him all the verbal assistance I could every time we talked on the phone in terms of how he was doing and what the plan was to help him. Right, but you were no longer physically there to actually assist in this, correct? That's correct. Okay. So I'm going to take you to March 22nd, I believe is the date that you testified about. And on that day, you and your wife went down to Barnegat, correct? We did. And you saw your son that day, correct? Correct. And you saw Corey that day, correct? We did. And you spent a few hours with your son and you spent a few hours with Corey, right? Correct. And your wife noticed that Corey had a bruise on his forehead, correct? He did. And did you see the bruise located on Corey's forehead? I did. And during the course 
of this case on April 2nd of 2021, after Corey passed, you spoke to Detective Mitchell with the prosecutor's office, right? I did. And you gave him a pretty long statement, correct? It was. And when you were speaking to the detective, nowhere did you tell him that Corey had this bruise when you saw him on the 22nd, correct? I don't believe I mentioned it. And with all of your training that you just talked about and being a police officer and in Homeland Security, this wasn't important for you to mention when you were talking to the detective, correct? I didn't think it was any more significant than him telling me he fell on the treadmill. Okay. So Corey told you that he fell on the treadmill? It was a joint discussion at dinner. Okay. And again, this wasn't important to you at that time? Well, it was important that he had a scrape on his forehead, but I didn't think to mention it to Detective Mitchell. Okay. Now, calling your attention to April 2nd, you spoke to your son while you were driving down to the hospital in Stafford, correct? Correct. And when you spoke to your son while you were driving to the hospital, you told your son that you were going to contact the police, correct? I did. And that was based upon conversations that you had with your son on that day, correct? It was. And when you got to the hospital, after you had told your son that you were going to contact the police, your son wasn't there at the hospital, correct? He wasn't in the emergency room, no. And when you got to the hospital, Corey was there by himself without any family member, correct? That's correct. They wouldn't let my wife and I in. And your son, though, he was not with Corey when you got to the hospital, right? No. And in the time between from when your son left until you got there, Corey was alone in the hospital without any family members, correct? As far as I know. And when you got to the hospital and your son is not there, you were trying to find him, correct? Correct. And you were basically telling him to come back, correct? When I did talk to him, I told him he needed to come back. Right. And, in fact, you didn't even talk to your son again until the following day, correct? That's correct. And that would have been on April 3rd, correct? Yes. And let's say the night of April 2nd, you didn't talk to your son, correct? I didn't talk to him, no. And you didn't know where he was the night of April 2nd, correct? I didn't, no. And then the morning of April 3rd, you didn't speak to your son, correct? No. And you didn't know where he was the morning of April 3rd, correct? No. And then finally, on April 3rd, your son calls you, correct? Correct. And when he called you, he was in Arkansas, correct? That's what I believe, and I believe it from looking at the phone log. I don't remember him telling me he was in Arkansas. But it's your understanding, based upon what you reviewed, that he was in Arkansas, correct? That's what I believe. Oh. And then you're the person who told your son to come back, correct? We all did. And you told him that he needed to get home from Arkansas, correct? Correct. Now, the next time you saw your son would have been on April 5th, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, that summer, your son and his now girlfriend, what's her name? Laura. Okay. So that summer, your son and Laura actually went on a hiking trip, correct? They did. And that would have been a few months after Corey passed? Three months. And the two of them went hiking in the Appalachian 
trails, correct? No, they were in Pennsylvania. I think it was the Appalachian Trail. And they also went on a van trip up in Maine. Isn't that correct? I don't recall that. But they spent time traveling together, correct? That was, yes. And that only would have been a few months after Corey's passing, correct? August is three months after he passed, yes. Thank you, Judge. No further questions. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Gregor, on cross-examination, Ms. Lento asked you if anybody was with Corey when you were on your way down to Southern Ocean Hospital, right? Yes. Okay. On your way from Monroe to Barnegat, were you aware that Corey had already passed? Yes. Thanks. No further questions, Judge. All right, sir. Thank you. You're excused. Counsel, I see you outside.